Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you rich toward God? Obviously, Jesus in his story does not leave any room for doubt when he tells the story about a man who strikes it rich, plans to live an easy life, and no sooner finds out from God that he would not have a chance to enjoy his success. And at the end, Jesus makes this unmistakable point to us and to his listeners that day. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If that question, are you rich toward God, makes you just a little bit uncomfortable, just think about the man who originally had asked Jesus to intervene to referee in this dispute he was having with his brother. I don't know any pastors who are willing to call out people in their sermon personally, but it seems that Jesus had no problem taking this man's question and then turning to the crowds and publicly calling him out, not just him, but everyone, for the greed that lives in the hearts. To the man's defense, it wasn't all that uncommon in his day that people would bring their disputes to rabbis, hoping that the Jewish law would shed some light and, per and perhaps give a, a judgment in their favor. Yet Jesus did not come to settle disputes about how much of dad's farm you're going to get. In fact, in warning this man and the, the entire crowd, Jesus was showing that that this man's greater threat was not losing out on part of his inheritance, getting cheated by his older brother. It was what was in his heart. It was the covetousness, the greed, the idea that if I only had enough more, then I would be secure, then I would be happy. And that same threat, of course, lives today, which makes the question, are you rich toward God? An especially important one for us. And it's not an easy one to answer. In my, my study this week, I came across one Bible commentator who, had, commentator who had this to say about this parable. He said, I know of no more difficult topic to apply personally or to the lives of Western Christians. And by Western Christians, of course, he means us. Notice that this commentator pointed out it's not a hard parable to understand. It's hard for us to apply. In other words, we all, we all understand what Jesus was saying when he told the crowd, life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Wouldn't you agree that this is one of the least controversial Bible teachings? That life is not a competition to see who gets the most and in the end, if you have more than your neighbor, you somehow win. No, we all know, everyone knows that, that money can't buy happiness. It doesn't buy you any lasting security. Just look at the man in Jesus' story, this rich man whose land produced for him this tremendous crop. And notice what didn't happen when this crop came into his hands. There was no word of gratitude, no thank you, Lord, just an inward turning to himself, uh, pondering how he was going to make use of this, and then a plan, a plan to take life easy, to enjoy life, to eat and to drink and to be merry, and realize this man was not a fool, not when it comes to his business, to his farming ability. He was a fool in this way. He trusted, he believed that his wealth what he had just gotten could buy him that security. And we all know it's not true that life is not about getting bigger and more and fancier and newer. Yet I fear, I fear that taking this knowledge and applying it to our lives, well, that's another matter. I fear that we might kind of be like the skydiver who while his feet are standing on the ground says, I trust my parachute, it'll open. But then has a different story when there are 10,000 feet between his feet and the ground. It's easy for us to say, I trust God, not in money. But it's a whole other, another story. Do we have the guts to actually live that way? 
Where is your faith most seen when it comes to your trust in wealth? Not in what you and I say, but it's in what we do. And I realize that Christians, again, are, we're not unique in pointing out the materialism of our age. In fact, there are secular answers to materialism. Minimalism. Marie Kondo comes, and she is a symbol of all that stands against stuff and getting more stuff. But realize that the answer is not just pivoting away from the pursuit of wealth and stuff, but we have to turn somewhere. And as Christians, we have the somewhere to which we turn. We have the answer. We have the promises of God which provide that which wealth cannot. In fact, there is a passage, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, that puts our salvation into financial terms. It's from 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul wrote, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And this is it. This is what brings us together that our Lord Jesus, who is rich in that he is God over all, became poor for us on his cross. And he says to us that you are rich. When you put your hand into the pocket of faith, you don't just pull out a couple nickels and some lint. You find the most tremendous treasures that, that truly cannot be even put into words. We find the promises of God that sustain us when life's catastrophes come. You realize that financial crises and, and health that's compromised, all sorts of things that don't turn out the way we plan, COVID, all of this cannot be touched by what our Lord Jesus has promised. And he comes to you and he says, I have become poor on my cross so that you are rich. I will never leave you I will never forsake you. No, I love you. I have made you my own. I welcome you as my own. I have a place prepared for you in heaven. And nothing in this world can separate you from me. In fact, when you stop to think about it, it's when we face catastrophes and loss in this life that we begin to let hold of our tight grip on the things of this world and hold all the more to our truest treasure. And when you do, you realize that in your hand is another gift that money cannot buy. And that is the gift of having a heart that's content. Uh, truly a heart that is satisfied and filled, that knows I have everything because I have Christ and he has me. This world, of course, is full of people marketers and others who, who try to convince us not to be content, that there is more you need in life. And that's because content people don't make good consumers. But you and I, we live with a reality. With our hands holding tight to the treasures of Christ. That even when the car breaks down again and the dishwasher starts leaking. When all of life seems to be crumbling. Not that we don't have to deal with these things or are not overwhelmed with them at times. But, but we can step back and look at the wreckage of life. That's what it feels like sometimes. And at the end of the day we can still be content. Because we know that our Lord Jesus, in the end, will make all things right. And he holds us. Yes, this is the treasure that is ours. And the challenge that is ours to hold on to this, not just in our minds, but that we would take this faith and these promises that are yours through baptism, and that they would travel through our bodies and into our fingers, into the way that we use our wealth. And we handle our riches. And I'll tell you, my greatest fear with a sermon like this is this, that you and I would sit here nodding along with Jesus saying, yep, life isn't about getting richer. Money can't buy what Jesus alone gives. But then in the end, we would not go home and give any real thought or evaluation to our lives, to our attitudes, to our wealth, and that we would not change any of our behaviors that we've become so comfortable with. But instead, we'd be kind of like that skydiver who says, I trust you, Jesus, but I'm not willing to jump. Instead, I, I trust that this career, it's going to be the answer. Or this financial plan, this budget, 
And in the end, I'll put that faith in my back pocket. It's my life insurance plan, just in case this Jesus stuff turns out to be true. And at least I'll have heaven waiting for me. Now realize that there is no separation here between our treasure in Christ and the way we treat and use our wealth. And it's, it's worth taking some time to think about the way that Christians ought to view wealth and compare it with the way this world does. Just take the subject that I think Jesus' parable touches on directly. You think it's a little eerie that the way the man, the rich fool, talked about his future sounds exactly like the way that we as Americans often talk about retirement? That once we have enough, we've stored up enough, then we say to ourselves, Self, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. I'm not suggesting that Christians wouldn't think about a time when, when you won't continue in the career that has occupied most of your vocation as far as your work outside of home. Or that we wouldn't plan. But I am saying that our view on something like retirement ought to be different than what the rich fool thought about the years that were to come. That instead of thinking, ah, retirement is finally when I can do what I want, perhaps it's a time where with more time on my hands I can serve in new and different ways. When I have to hang up my work for whatever reason, God opens up other opportunities for me to serve and ultimately at the end of life to be served by others. Just realize that if you approach retirement thinking it's my 401k or my Roth IRA that's going to be my security in my old age, you're setting yourself up for disappointment for you will never have enough. The questions of, is there enough? What if I get sick? Will haunt you the day that you let go of your wealth and are taken from this world. Yes, the, the truth is is that if you think your security is found in wealth, you will be disappointed. And you've probably known people like I have who have clutched every single penny in life only to find in retirement their life taken from them or their life completely changed by sickness or disease or all of their wealth that they worked so hard for and held on to. Every single penny is drained as they spend their last days in the assisted living facility. You know, Solomon, the richest man to have ever left, lived, he looked at the pursuit of wealth and he said, if you think that life is just about getting more, then you are chasing something that is meaningless. We realize that this discussion about something like retirement, it fits into the broader picture of what we as Christians would think about when it comes to wealth. It really fits into that question that we began with this morning. Am I rich toward God? Now, as you think about that question, am I rich toward God? Don't, don't think the preacher is now going to talk about offerings as if that is the only way that we show our riches towards God. You think that way, you're thinking much too narrowly. The fact is, you and I, we own nothing. It all belongs to God. What we have in this world is on loan. And if you don't believe me, just ask yourself how much you get to take with you. And as we consider then our wealth, we consider it in view of all of the claims that God has put on us and the ways that God has called us to use our wealth to his glory in this world. I mean, realize that question, am I rich towards God? It, it finds its answer in the riches of God that faith holds on to. And it finds its answer in the contentment that God has given us. Contentment which gives birth to generosity. When you think about it, those two really go hand in hand. Contentment and generosity, kind of like the roots of a tree and the trunk and the branches. The contentment goes deep into the heart of the Christian and out of our life, comes generosity. Ask yourself, why were the early Christians so willing to sell their possessions and give generously to those who did not have? You know, it wasn't because they were poor financial managers. 
And it wasn't because they thought, Jesus is going to come tomorrow, so what's the point of having this wealth? Ultimately, it was because they were so content with what they had that they were willing to give it up and place their trust in God. And really, for us, every act of generosity that a Christian does is an act of defiance against the lie that says, my hope, my happiness, my security comes from my wealth. Just think about it. When you give something away, you're not just saying, I trust you, God. I don't trust in my money. You're showing it. Or when you give an offering, yes, an offering at church, or go online and do it electronically, you're not just saying, God, you are my treasure, and what I give, I know I will not be um, in loss for, but you will provide all I need. You are showing it. This contentment brings generosity. When you think of this parable, there's one detail One detail in this parable that I think is worth pointing out, it's that it is the only story Jesus told where God himself makes an appearance. There are other parables, of course, where there are are people that stand for God. But here God actually intervenes. Here he speaks up and talks to the fool. Which ought to show us that God is interested in our wealth and how we think of our riches. As God knows our bank accounts, he knows how much debt we carry and how that debt might control us. He knows how much we tip. He knows how much we save. He knows how much we give away. Yet don't think that that being rich toward God is something that's answered in dollars and cents. While God knows all of these numbers and and what's on the ledgers and bank accounts, he also knows our hearts. And he knows whether our hearts have made him our treasure or something else. Just realize that the rich fool was a fool before he got rich. It wasn't wealth that made him a fool. It was the belief that this wealth would set him free. And a person who is wise can be either poor or wealthy. But they are wise because they have found their treasure in Christ. They have made their riches in something that this world will never rip away. They have a treasure that will endure. And all of us today ought to reinvest in these truest riches to build a wealth that will endure forever. Amen.